Yeah. Hi, all. Uh, as was said, my name is Lauren Voswinkel. My Twitter tag is up there with my GitHub tag as well. Um, and so before we started, I wanted to talk about um, uh, I wanted to talk about the the format of this uh, talk as we go as we go on. It's basically in uh, talking about the fundamentals of how JavaScript works and what features and whatnot are available to uh, to us as a language when we are using JavaScript. Um, the style of the of the talk is such that um, it's g progressively grows. Um, so if you don't understand something that I that I'm talking about, please feel free to interrupt and raise your hand and ask a question for me to elaborate more. Because if you get lost early on, it will just be harder down as time goes on. So um, it's more of a classroom type of, of session more than a an actual like I'm just going to talk at you type of session. So uh, with that, let's get started. So in JavaScript, there are two different types of objects. There are value types, or there are two different types of yeah, objects. Um, there are value types, and there are reference types. Uh, value types are things like integers, strings, uh, floating points, and whatnot. Uh, so when you pass them into a function um, and modify them, uh, you can modify the you can modify what the the value actually is. However, unless you actually assign it, it doesn't change the number that was passed in. Um, so in this function, we're basically incrementing the num incrementing the number uh, that gets outputted to the console as one, and then we output the original value of what we had set because the value does not pass into the function. It's effectively a copy. Um, the other type, reference types, are things like arrays and objects, um, which are kind of like uh, dictionaries or lists in most other languages. Um, and these, when you pass them into a function, a reference to the actual object is passed in so that you are modifying the actual object. So in this particular case, if you increment, uh, if you increment the, the array, um, or if you increment the value of the array, uh, which is done in lines 13 and 14, you have the same pro you have the same issue uh, with the value types. However, when you increment uh, directly with the array, it actually does increment what was set outside of the function. Um, so, another thing to talk about is the variable scopes. So, right now we're globally defining a, and then um, not passing it in, but modifying it as though it's a closure. Uh, for those who don't know, a closure is a function that has a reference to a variable not defined within its own scope. Um, a function that has only that modifies and uses only variables defined within its own scope is known as a peer function. Um, so in this particular case, increment is a closure that is actually incrementing the value um, of a directly. So we find that when you're not passing it in, instead of using it as a closure, it actually does increment um, as normal for a, like, for a reference value or what have you. So um, what happens when there's a conflict, if you define A inside of the function, you'll find that it actually does keep the value um, of the, 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 global, the global variable is not incremented because the scope of the uh, A inside of the function is actually what is being modified. Um, so what happens when we define A after we do a modification? Um, many times people will look at something like this and think, well, it would actually end up using the A that's defined globally. However, that's not the case. JavaScript does something that is known as hoisting. Um, hoisting is when a variable is defined inside of any type of scope, the, the definition of that scope, or of the variable inside of that scope, 
is brought to the top or forefront and is only, a, is only assigned a value when, um, when the instruction is hit during execution. So in this case, we know inside of increment that there is an A function defined or an A variable defined, and, but we don't know what that value is. So it's actually, um, it's easier to see with a, a string or not modifying um, the, the value. So that we have a definition of something and then inside of the function, we say, okay, try to say something um, and find that it's undefined because A on line five, we know about it, however, we haven't set it to test yet. So that is, so hoisting basically brings, um, like hoisting is a way of setting the, var setting the variables for any type of environment or scope um, during the parsing phase rather than the execution phase. So now I will start talking about environments and what environments are, they're, as I just said, they're defined during the parsing before execution. They contain references to their parent scope and um, variables defined higher up in the, in the scope um, have a broader domain, but a lower priority. So basically, if you overwrite it in a more, like in a deeper nesting, it will take, the, the deeper nested will take a priority, will take priority over the, um, the more global name space. Um, and then namespaces are your friend in the sense that if you are creating a library or if you are um, dealing with a, series of, of behaviors that you want to uh, give to your users, the, uh, the problem often happens is that when you're including other libraries, you can sometimes have namespace conflicts. And really, namespace collisions are confusing and terrible because they give you really bizarre errors because you are overwriting references or you are having your references overwritten and it gives you very, very strange behavior. So namespaces are incredibly important. Um, basically what namespacing means is um, try to set, your, set up your functionality inside of an object so that it's nested um, nicely and doesn't provide any global naming collisions. Um, an environment, an environment uh, or variable environment will look something like this with the, um, the A0, B3 being the, um, the most indented piece of code, basically, the, furthest, the, 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 the first thing that gets picked up. And then the dot dot is actually um, similar to a uh, command line directory dot dot, which brings you to the parent directory. Um, and so they are nested in that type of fashion. And the lookup basically goes um, one level at a time, trying to find something that matches it. If it can't find anything that matches it, it then just says that it's undefined. Any questions so far? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, so functions. Um, Functions are pretty simple uh, in the fact that they are self-contained blocks of code, um, as in most languages. You have, you have in here a function that takes, has an arity of two, meaning it takes two variables, a and b, and then just returns the, uh, their addition. But sometimes people want to do something that is kind of partially defined or applied. Um, and so, a lot of times I've seen things where they basically rewrite a broader function or a, a, a more, they rewrite, they write a broader function and then uh, use like uh, the function definition to then say pass in something specific into this broader function um, or people will actually just make new functions and kind of pollute namespaces. Um, however, JavaScript actually allows you to, uh, to do things that a lot of functional languages also support, actually most of them should, um, which is currying and partial application. So um, like I said before, a closure is something that um, has, is a function that has a reference 
to a variable defined outside of its own scope. Um, and so in this particular case, we are creating an add function that is what's known as curried. A curried function is taking a function that has an arity of greater than one, it takes more than one argument, and breaks it down into, a, into multiple functions that take one argument each and allow you to um, partially apply the function, basically. So in this particular case, you can do the, do the standard two-digit adding of adding two and five by calling two functions um, in a row. Basically, add two returns a function that is partially applied, and then you call that function with five, and it adds the second part. Um, so the so add two basically returns a closure that has a bound to two. So the good thing about this is that you can actually very easily use it to make small utilitarian functions um, such as add two and add five. I'm not sure why you would actually do that, but you can partially apply functions and give them uh, and give them or hold on to them so that they can be used later. Uh, so it's it's a way, it's a really great way to reuse code in that sense. Um, so, is there any questions about partial application or currying dash? Okay, so I think I understand what you've written here. Okay. Basically, instead of writing a function to specifically add two numbers together, you're using the included add function but that already is in JavaScript and kind of. It looks like it, sort of. Now, so so what's happening in this in this particular sense is that lines one through five are are a function that that has been written uh -huh. that takes one uh, that takes one parameter. That first parameter, in this case a, um, gets bound to uh, what is passed in. So in this case two, um, and then the function on lines two through four is then returned to the caller. And that caller basically now has a function where A is set to two. And then you can call the second function that was returned with another number, say five or three or what have you, and it will add two and whatever number you pass in also with, one, with a single argument. Does that make sense? <laughs> the, oh, 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 so line, is line 12 and line 13 separate from this? Yeah, so, well, no, line 12 and line 13 are the extensions of line 9 and 10. So basically, line 9 um, is, is mapping uh, add with 2 passed in as um, add 2, and then uh, add with 5 passed in as add 5, and then they're being called down here to... Um, to do the second step of lines two through oh, four. I see. So instead of defining add two as a separate function, you are instead of setting add two as a variable that has five passed in because it's actually set to a function. Mm -hmm. okay. Basically, the ability to return a function is something that functional languages uh, use quite a bit. It's a, it's a completely different paradigm than most people are used to. <laughs> it's yeah. similar to uh, to lambdas and procs in Ruby. Um, you could return a function as variable. Yeah. That's new. Thank so um, it's actually where the next thing um, is that functions, because they can be bound to variables, um, can also be utilized to be passed in as arguments. So um, a very common function in uh, in most programming languages is the map function that just takes a function and applies it to all of the values inside of an array. Um, and so in this particular case, we're creating an add one function that is the, that is the same, as, same as add two and add five here, um, and then applying that to the array on line eight. And the output is just two, four, six, and eight. Um, so basically, whenever you've bound a, uh, a function to a variable, it can be used as any other argument and then can be called inside of another function just by using the 
the parameter name and um, the double parentheses to actually call the function. Any questions on that? Okay. So uh, a very common thing in JavaScript um, is this phenomenon of callback pyramids, which is basically when you've got a callback or a, a function that's expecting a callback and somebody uses an anonymous function inside of that uh, and then inside of that anonymous function, they're using another function that requires another callback and you just continue this down the line until you get like seven indentations and it's a really big pain in the ass to actually read and understand what the hell's going on. Excuse my, my language. Um, I get frustrated when I see these. Um, so it is possible to, to dismantle these pyramids by breaking them down and actually giving these functions names so that you can actually call them with the names as appropriate. However, there's a problem that happens a lot of times. What ends up happening is you have these callback pyramids that start adding state of some sort as they go along. So, Lines two, lines five, and line seven basically create it where you can't decompose this very well. It's very difficult to actually um, break this apart because of the, the, content, the environments that are being then passed as part, of the, as part of the callback pyramid. However, there is actually a way to deal with this as well. JavaScript has two functions that can be used on functions that are bound in, that are bound, uh, in the namespace. Um, these functions are called call and apply. Uh, call and apply are, I'll actually come back to this slide. Call and apply actually allow the execution of a function with any environment being passed in arbitrarily. Um, so in programming, you often hear people use the term method rather than function. And the difference between a method and a function is that a method is executed with the object that it is bound to as its environment. Um, so the difference between call and apply is that call accepts arguments to the function individually. So as you add more arguments uh, to the to call, it actually will add them, then pass them onto the function that it is being used, being called on. It's a difficult thing to talk about having a function that has a function. Um, but apply accepts the arguments as a second parameter to the function as an array or array-like object. So going back here, we have um, the same sim a similar type of breakdown. However, we're using um, apply and uh, call on lines six and 11 to basically pass in the context, i.e. this, um, with either arguments or no arguments um, based on it as they are necessary. Am I, did my mic cut out? Okay. Um, so, this is a really kind of mind-bending type of, of mental gymnastics to understand that like the, the click action function has, a, has its environment and is setting like thing one as a variable inside of that environment. And then on line six, um, it is being passed to after fetch using apply saying, okay, everything that was, um, everything that was passed in or modified on this particular runtime environment, um, as well as the arguments passed into the function on uh, click action, because if we go back here, you can see that click action, or no, I'm sorry, after fetch is supposed to have the, the arguments. Regardless, it's really kind of confusing, but you can pass the, you can pass like thing one and thing two, uh, as they get added to the environments by passing the environments themselves to the different functions. Um, this allows for some really, really flexible types of, of changes. So we had... Uh, 
So yeah, basically, uh, call and apply end up actually calling this, the function that they're being used on. Um, and then, like, in, on line six, you're passing in uh, arguments, which is actually a, uh, a, special, uh, a special object, which we're going to talk about in, in, just a, in just a little bit. Um, and the first argument for both call and apply is the environment that you want the function to actually run in using. So uh, in this case, we're passing just this, meaning the function's own, uh, th the parent function's own uh, runtime environment. So as you make modifications to that environment using thing, like adding thing one and thing two, that is also being passed to the next function down the chain. So we'll see more examples of this, so hopefully it'll get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more understandable as we go. But um, I will obviously answer questions as they, as they crop up. So we can go back to, to the slide that I just had. I apparently had forethought. Um, and I then introduced the, and started talking about the concept of arguments, which you can see over on line six. Um, and arguments is a special object um, that basically, um, well, let's go take a step back. Basically, all functions have a length that can be discovered by calling function dot length. Um, so in other words, in this case, if we went back and said click action dot length, um, it then would give back uh, one as as the the arity because um, e is actually in there. After fetch would give uh, when you call length would give three. So the length is equal to the number the number of the named arguments as I just said the func which is the function's arity. Um, and all arguments, even one even accounted ones, are available in the arguments object. The per what I mean by this is the accounted ones is that in JavaScript, you can actually give an arbitrary number of arguments to any function. You are not bound to the, to the arity that you've actually written. Um, unaccounted arguments can actually be discerned or, or pulled out of the arguments object by using array.slice with arguments as a context. So this is where we're gonna start getting into exploring how to use call with um, other, uh, to, to change the context. So here we are taking the slice method from array's prototype, and we are binding it to this variable so that we can use it without instantiating an array each time. Um, and then inside of this function, we are saying, okay, call the, the prototypes method with the arguments that are passed into this function um, and the length of the function that is being currently executed, so in this case, one. Um, and then we map that particular array that we get back, which in this case is everything except for the first element in, uh, in the arguments, and then we add um, the number to that. So it's kind of a, a, a mapping type of function. Uh, so does anybody want me to, to talk about how call is being used or, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so slice dot, so if you just called slice with the, with the various, um, with the, the parentheses, the problem is, is because slice, in this case, is expecting to be called as a method of an array, it has no, um, it has no understanding of what is actually operating on. Like in, uh, in most cases with something like a string or what have you, when you're doing replace, you have the string and then you do dot replace. So that string is actually the context of the function's call. So when you call this, it passes back the, the, the string itself. 
in this case, um, slice is expecting an array to be given to it as the context. So when you are call, calling this inside of slice, it's expecting it to get back an array. However, because we're not using it on an array, um, we're basically saying we're basically saying, okay, here is the array that I actually want you to look at. And in this case, the arguments func the arguments object of this function. Does that make sense? <laughs> Go ahead. So um, arguments is not actually an array, oh. and that's that's the that's the problem. Um, it is an array-like object, <laughs> and the fact that it actually responds to like zero, like to to square brackets zero, one, two, three, et cetera, so on and so forth, but it doesn't actually have um, the array prototype, basically, so it doesn't have the slice method. Does that make sense? Um, it's, I, you know, I, I haven't looked too closely at it. I just kind of like accepted that, okay, it's an array that doesn't have arrays methods. So um, it's got a couple of other. Um, basically. So as like, so in this particular case, add num to arbitrary, you would basically pass in a number, say like three, and then just start passing a whole bunch of different arguments. So we could say like four, five, and six come after that. And then it gets um, four, five, and six by slicing the three, four, five, six that's in the arguments, um, and then takes num, which in this case is bound to three by the normal function call, and adds three to each one of four, five, and six that we get. That no, that's fine. So, so this dot length is calling is calling dot length on arguments. No, uh, this dot length is calling uh, calling dot length on the function itself. Oh right, to get that error. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So what would so is this a, a locked uh, variable that is going to do this kind of work? Uh, this is this is a um, the this keyword is bound to the um, to the object that it is running in. In this case, a function is actually an object, and it, the the dot length is a method on the function. So if I like set bar this, I would get some weird result. Yes, you would. Okay. Never do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, so we we just talked about prototype, which is this kind of which is an interesting concept in Java that most other languages don't have. Our JavaScript is a prototypical prototypical or prototypal language, depending on who you ask, um, and therefore it actually doesn't have traditional classes. Um, JavaScript classes are actually objects with two requirements. Um, they have to have a constructor function, and they have to have a prototype. So constructors are functions. The interesting part about JavaScript is that functions are constructors. <laughs> the difference between a function and a constructor is the new keyword. Effectively, any function can be called with the new keyword in front of it, and it will give back an object. In this case, we're saying, here's a function, and it does random things. In this case, it's just returning a, a string that says stuff and things. When we call on line six new random things, we get back an object, like I said, very similar to a hash or a dictionary in most languages, that is basically completely empty. The reason why this is empty is because new changes a function to automatically return 
the context or this meta object. So in this particular case, we can explore this by actually saying, okay, here's our random thing function again, and we're gonna set a test variable above uh, the, that in context, and we're going to set that variable as a closure to this. When we do that, the triple equals uh, equality operator actually returns two between things and test. They are effectively the same exact thing. Because what ends up happening is after all of this is run, that return statement doesn't actually happen and new is saying return the context instead. Does anyone need more of an elaboration on that? Okay, uh, you had a... Is that a typo or is it supposed to have a different Which one? Oh yes, I'm sorry, that, I, that is a typo. It is, it is random, random thing is what's supposed to be written, uh, run. I apologize. So, um, any other questions? Like, um, so if we go back a little bit. Back here, we were we were talking about how how this is kind of bound to uh, the function as an object. Um, when you call new the function is effectively called with an empty object as the context. So basically just the, 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 the curly braces. And then that, that object, the, this in this case, is then returned to the caller of new with the function. So basically, new random thing could actually be rewritten kind of as, it, it can't in, in practicality, but it could theoretically be rewritten as random thing dot call with a new object just passed in um, and, the, and no arguments. And then instead of actually returning stuff and things, it would just give me back that object that was passed in. Go ahead. Yep, they're dev nulled. Uh, stuff at the end of it. Um, so that's actually that's actually an interesting question. Stuff um, is actually kept as part of the closure, but you can't actually access it because there's nothing that ends up trying to trying to utilize it. So it probably gets garbage collected. I'm not 100% sure about that. You would have, yes. So, um, so I just showed that that particular equality, and you can see like an, a further extrapolation of that um, is if you created another uh, another random thing, and then tried to compare those two objects that you've created, they are not equal to each other because objects, um, different instances of the same object are not equal um, because of object IDs, basically. Um, and, then the, and then test is now equal to the second object that we've created. It is no longer equal to the first object because it's been reassigned. Does that make sense? Does it, Um, the, this is just a, a, an explanation of how it's actual how it's actually working. Um, so if you want me to to try to explain it again, uh, I can. Is anybody okay? Are you so? What is what? Yeah. Things equal equals does not equal test anymore, because uh, because, because test got reassigned yeah. on on line five. Um, 
That's that's the problem with namespace collisions. Basically, is that it like it leads to things being overwritten that you don't anticipate being overwritten. Uh, it's kind of leaky. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, it is an object, so it no longer it no longer actually returns anything really. Um, so it's no longer so so things is not a function anymore. It is just uh, an object, which is basically uh, something that you can query. Objects usually have functions that can then be called on them, but in this case, there is no things function inherent to itself. It would just give back itself if you were to just say uh, if you were to just type things into the console. It would just give you the empty hash. Mm, yes, you cannot do things dot stuff because it is not uh, line four is not setting it to this dot stuff. It is just setting it to stuff on the context of the function itself. So this is like a mind bending concept that the, that functions kind of serve a double duty when you call them with new. I'm, I'm by, line. by line five. Um, so what's happening in line five? Um, like I said, uh, new when you're running it is basically saying uh, function dot call with a new object as the context, and then this is saying I want to assign test to that new or I want to assign that a new that new object to test, and then because new also returns that object the context, it then um, is passes this equality. Like they are the same reference to the same object. <laughs> it's 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 a little difficult. Um, so basically, when you're calling new, um, it is changing it from the standard way of running as a function and actually asking it to become a constructor. Um, so there is a way to to create uh, so. Normally, when you're when you're doing a, a constructor, you'll see something much more similar to to basically lines one through four, and then the the closing bracket, where you're saying this dot side like this dot side or this dot stuff equals something, and then because this is returned, it's been set on that object that that gets returned. Um, so what I'm talking about here or discussing with this is that you can create helpers inside of a constructor function, basically defining other functions inside of a constructor that you then utilize in the, the creation of, um, of the, the object. However, you can't, you can't just call them using the, the, the parentheses um, because it, these don't have the same context as the object above it. However, if you use the call or apply um, meta methods, basically, um, and pass in the this object that's the same as like what you see here, uh, that object is passed down, and then you can modify it in these helper functions. So it's a good way to to kind of separate out logic that you might have in, in the construction of new objects um, so that you can more easily see, OK, um, so this is actually a Netrunner reference. Um, um, but you can see here that like when we're trying to set the faction of a card, um, basically, if it's not inside of this, uh, in, if it's not inside of this array, we're throwing, a, we're throwing an error. Uh, otherwise, we set this dot faction equal to the faction that was passed in. Um, so it's by passing this um, to this function as the context, we're able to modify it. Does that make sense? <laughs> or do I need to go into more? Okay. So just a clarifying question. Okay. So this is a constructor. Right. Mm -hmm. Which Um, 
So by by calling runner using the new using the new keyword, um, these are then being like these functions here are then being called on lines three and four. Um, these functions are not available outside of the object because they are not being set to the this object. Like I could like it is possible to say like this dot set faction equals function. And then it would be available outside of the outside of of the um, constructor because it's been bound to the object that gets returned. So then that object would actually have it in a similar way that um, the object has side and faction and these other um, attributes attached to it when it gets returned. Basically, yes. Exactly. It is, it is more than private. It is private just to this constructor. Uh, JavaScript does not really have private functions because um, basically when you're, making a, when you're making an object, everything is available. Otherwise, it ends up basically getting garbage collected. You can do private variables effectively by, um, by having Rather than saying this dot side, saying okay um, var side, and then inside of these functions that you might set to uh, that you might set to the, the this object, you then use it inside of these functions, and it can access it because it is a closure. So it's a, it's a complicated thing to wrap your head around, and, and I understand that. Um, so the other part of a the other part of the the object creation is that. Um, all objects should have prototypes, and prototypes are actually just standard objects. Basically, what I mean by that is any object can actually be used as a prototype for a constructor method. And what I mean by that, and we'll take that, is that we can define an object up here just using a literal definition of an object and create these different functions. And then when we create a constructor function, in this case, the SUS constructor function, we can set the prototype to the object that we created before. Any object can be, can be replaced for that. And what ends up happening is when we call new with SUS, it actually basically copies the methods on the prototype to the, um, to the instance that gets returned. Does anyone want a definition of what that means? Like, or uh, to talk a little bit more about that? Go ahead. So one question, is it basically just passing the prototype object as the, um, the context to the function when it's calling it, or um, it's doing it some other way? It's, it's doing it some other way. Basically, what ends up happening is the prototype, uh, actually, you know, um, you, may be, you may be right. The prototype may actually be what gets passed into the constructor function uh, as the this, and, or a copy of it, rather. Um, and then you modify it inside of the inside of the actual function so that it returns um, yeah. the 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 yeah. <laughs> question is if in function SUS you redefined this dot one func, yeah. would it come out with what was in the prototype or what was in the it would pr I believe it would come out with what's in SUS. I'm not entirely certain. Okay. That would be something that you should try like on your own and I would be I would be very interested to know that actually. Um, so, so, so now once you've, once you've done that on line twelve, mm -hmm. yeah. Could you then call um, You can call directly Seuss dot one funk, I believe, um, and you can also call one funk on any instance of Seuss that gets created. The, the behavior will be slightly different on those two, on those two calls because of the, the context of the function when it's run. In this particular case, they're, they're still going to return one both times. But like if Seuss had uh, particular um, attributes to it that, that a, an instance of Seuss did not, then it might cause some very strange behaviors. The preferred, the preferred way to access a, a 
um, a method from a prototype is to, to create an instance of the prototype, unless you're doing something really bizarre like we did like a little ways back. Um, but that way, that what we did earlier was kind of an exception to the rule. Um, normally, when you create an object, you're just expected to use uh, the functions on the object that you create. Um, so one thing that a lot of people re don't realize that JavaScript actually has is a concept of inheritance. You can create um, inherited objects. Um, here we define the, the standard like object inheritance uh, class animal um, with a genus and a species on it. Um, and the prototype then has a speak function that just is silence because we don't know what type of, uh, type of animal is being created. Um, and then we create a cat and then set the cat prototype to the animal prototype. So basically what that means is the prototype for animal has the speak function on it and then the cat prototype now also has that. And then we redefine speak to be a different function entirely so the cat says meow. The, there is one problem with this though. In this particular case, the way we've done it, we now have a cat that says meow and a bat that says meow. That, what we ended up doing was actually modifying the original object because the fact that they are reference types um, means that the references are the same object. So the way to actually do object inheritance um, is to, instead of calling cat.prototype equals animal.prototype, instead do cat.prototype equals create a new object from animal.prototype and then assign it. That way you get a completely different reference on a new object and that one you can modify to your heart's content to change whatever you feel like um, and it will not affect its um, parent class's prototype. And so in this case, we now have a bat that says absolutely nothing because bats don't actually say much of anything. <laughs> so to overview, um, we've talked about variable scopes. Um, I actually didn't talk much about the var keyword, so let me go back. The var keyword in this case is a direct ability to modify the environment and say, this is something that I am adding to the, the environment's dictionary, basically. Um, and then we talked about hoisting and variable lookup, closures versus pure functions, currying, partial application, callbacks, um, and then the pyramids with callbacks that use callbacks and avoiding callback pyramids. Talked about call and apply and then talked about some prototypical pro programming using constructors with constructor helper methods and the instance methods, which are the methods that are put on the prototype. Um, and then inheritance and prototype chaining, which is the concept of creating new objects from the parent class's prototype. So that's it. <laughs> Any... Any final questions? I say final because feel free to come up to me and ask any questions about this or just talk about like, oh, I've never seen that type of behavior before or just anything really. But any questions for right now? Go ahead. So uh, for years I've been a medium level JavaScript developer and you know, I've worked up with Stratford. Yeah. I've built stuff, but this advanced stuff doesn't really come up right now. So is there a good place to just kind of cram all the advanced bits in my head on one spot? So I got a lot of this material from Reginald Braithwaite's, and I probably just butchered his name. He's at Regenwald on uh, Twitter. His book, JavaScript Allongé, is basically a, an exploration of how to use JavaScript in a functional programming style. And a lot of what I just talked about um, came from that book in particular. Um, uh, Reginald Braithwaite, I, again, probably am butchering it. It's at R-A-G-A-N-W-A-L-D um, on Twitter. And you can actually get it for free. It is, in, it is free as in beer and free as in code. Um, so by all means, 
Look at that book. It is an amazing book on JavaScript and explores all sorts of things. Um, the other material I basically ended up getting because I was doing a side project dealing with Netrunner because I love that game. And it kind of got me hooked on, on learning more about JavaScript. Um, any other quest final questions? I have not read that, so I'm kind of interested. Can you say it again? It was, uh, JavaScript, the good part. Yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. Okay, give them a hand. Also, I work for Living Social, and we're hiring. We do